Good morning and blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Very, very briefly, um, we have some day villages who weren't here last night. We'll just recount what we went through last night very, very quickly, okay? Last night we began by talking about the changes that are taking place in the church, how house churches are growing globally, church attendance and denominational churches are declining rapidly. That's one of the trends you see in the church. Um, another obvious transition that's taken place is what internet has become. A lot more evangelism is done now on the internet, a lot more biblical exposition is done on the internet. It's good and it's bad, but it's, that's the vehicle now. Um, we cannot think of the church structurally the way we used to. We cannot think of it structurally the way we used to. Moriel, as we said, just our ministry in this year, just in this year in terms of subscriptions to Moriel TV and, and views on YouTube and things like this, from the 1st of January to the 31st of October, we had over a 170% growth, over 170% growth on internet. Um, by the end of the year, it'll be over 180% given present projections. Uh, it's very, very different than it used to be. On the other hand, things like conferences are, are basically static. You don't see a lot of young people. That's not their world. Their world is the world of the cyber world. They don't generally come to conferences in the same way the older generation did. There's a fundamental change taking place. We have to understand that we're in a period of transition. The ministry of Elijah always takes place in seasons of major, major transition. Last night, we looked at the major features of Elijah, if you were not here. We looked at, one, uh, he could control the rain, the outpourings of the Holy Spirit, which we'll look at today. Two, the ministry of Elijah had food in a famine. When the famine for the hearing of the word of God, the ministry of Elijah had food and had food to give to others. Third, although the mantle itself was not transferable, God had to do it, the mantle could cover others. The mantle of Elijah, the authority he had covered others. The anointing he had covered others. The sons of the prophets being among them. And we saw this carried over into the New Testament when the disciples of Jesus needed somebody to replace Judas, it had to be somebody around from the time, not of Jesus' ministry, but John's. Um, fourth, again, it is transitional. It is transitional. Fifth, he is up against idolatry, but the idolatry he was up against was always disguised. It was not other gods simply, it was other gods um, professing to be Yahweh, or counterfeiting Yahweh, or masquerading as Yahweh. There was a conflation of the true God and false gods. The Hebrew Baal, of course, as we know, was Yahweh, but the Canaanites had a separate Baal. But Jezebel tried to make people think one was the other, that they were the same, only culturally modified. That is not true, and that's what happens in the last days. The sixth thing we looked at is the conflict with Jezebel. The conflict with Jezebel becomes inevitable. Whoops. The conflict with Jezebel becomes inevitable. She, of course, personifies false religion, according to Jesus in Revelation chapter 2. And also, we related this to the growth of the feminism in the world getting into the church the Ahab-Jezebel relationship. Seventh, that Elijah, the ministry of Elijah, is always concerned with building and building up of a remnant. The building and building up of a remnant. We see this both in Kings and we see it in Romans chapter 11. And finally, the ministry of Elijah has to do with restoration. In Kings, restoration. Jesus says Elijah will come 
and restore all things. Malachi says, all things will be restored. Now last night we asked the question, how many people have never heard the teaching um, th that I didn't intend to do or plan to do? Um, Elijah, a man who could make it rain, it's more than 20 years old, but unfortunately, only about 40% of the people heard it and not all of those people remember it. 60% of the people who were la here last night have not heard it and we really cannot address this subject without looking at it. So turn with me please to 1 Kings chapter 17. Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power and presence of your spirit. In your grace and in your mercy, Lord God, open our eyes to your word its glory and its meaning. Let these things, Lord God, be pleasing to you and edifying to your people in these last days. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. Okay. Verse one of First Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. As we looked at last night, based on Isaiah 44.3 and on John 7, the outpouring of rain is a picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will not be outpoured. And we looked at Amos, the places not rained on would dry up, there would be no fruit. Story continues. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you will drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord for he went and lived by the brook of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Remember, as we looked at last night, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist had the same spirit. And we see the same patterns. The wicked woman Herodias turning the king against John, the way the wicked woman Jezebel turned the king Ahab against Elijah and so forth. It's the same pattern. All Jerusalem and Judea went out to the wilderness to hear John preach. He went out to the Jordan. He went to the east from Jerusalem out across the desert, uh, wilderness of Judah, the plain of Jericho, east of the Jordan, Bethany of the Jordan. He went east of the Jordan. He went out of the place that was considered to be the traditional place of, of, of God's people. He was not in the traditional place of God's people. Although the son of a high priest, he turned his back on the religious establishment and went out into the wilderness, and people flocked out to hear him. There was a famine for the hearing of the word of God. There had not been a prophet for over 400 years. So the people, in their hunger, in their desperation, were going out. God, in an age of Elijah, will meet the needs of his people and feed them in places and in ways they never would have expected. God will meet their need and feed them in places and in ways they never would have expected. The people were not being taught the word of God by the Levites, so they went out to the wilderness to somebody who turned his back on the Sanhedrin and on the religious establishment. They went out into the wilderness. Now we have to be careful. John the Baptist taught the truth. There were cults doing the same thing, who had beliefs that were fundamentally unscriptural. They were reacting to the corruption of the Sanhedrin and of the Sadducee-dominated priesthood, 
but they became cultic and took on false doctrines. I speak primarily of the Essenes, primarily of the Essenes. In the last days, it becomes the same thing. You will have people, groups, who see what's wrong with the church, who see what's wrong with the organized religious establishment, who see its hypocrisy, who see what's wrong with it, who see its, its, its immorality, and they separate themselves from it and set themselves up as the alternative only to have beliefs themselves which are not scriptural, the way the Essenes did. You've got the same thing today. The classic example would, of course, be the Jehovah's Witnesses. They would be a classic example, but they're not the only example by any means. You have other such cults, and that's how it happens. Just because somebody turns their back on the religious establishment, because they see what has gone wrong with the mainstream, because they see the hypocrisy, the corruption, because they see through that, and they break with it, there's always a danger of them setting up their own error. They replace one error with another. John the Baptist did not do that. In the spirit of Elijah, he restored. He taught the truth. He went to the Jordan. Now the Jordan can be higher at certain seasons, as we see in Jeremiah chapter 12, or it can be quite low, not much more than a brick. The Jordan River in certain places is no wider than this room at certain times of the year. It is no wider than this room at certain times of the year. You would, if you'd seen the Clyde, you would call the Jordan a creek or a brook more than you would call it a river, at least in certain places at certain times of the year. It is more like a creek or a brook than it is a river, okay? So the, the Hebrew term Nahal is, is one of them. In Israel, they could be the same thing depending on the rainy season, depending on the rainy season. During the rainy season, it could look like a river. During the season when it's not raining, it recedes in its size and in its depth to resemble a brook. That is true of the Jordan, it's true of the Wadis, it's true of the Yerkon River near Tel Aviv, it's true, of, it's true of the brook near Haifa that becomes a river and then it becomes a brook again where Elijah threw the ashes of the priests of, of Baal. Um, the Kidron is always a brook, but the others, well, it depends on the time of the year. It depends on the time of the year. Sometimes of the year, these things can be navigable by small craft. Other times of the year, you can wade across them. It just depends. So Elijah goes to the brook of Kiri to the east, and the ravens fed him. The ravens fed him. Notice he ate the food the ravens brought him, but he did not eat the ravens. The ravens were an unclean bird. They were not kosher. In desperate times, God will use, God will use non-believers to meet the needs of believers. He will use non-believers in desperate times to meet the needs of of believers. Look at the United States. You have a president who is not a Christian. He's on his fourth marriage. He has never professed to be born again or anything like that. His vice president is, however, and he appoints believers as his foreign secretary, as secretary of state is a believer. He appoints them to his cabinet but what does he do? Well, one, he blesses Israel more than any other president in American history. He's blessed Israel more than any other president. And secondly, he's pro-life. He's pro-Christian rights. <laughs> he actually stands up for the rights of Christians, uh, not only in the United States, but in other countries. He's outspoken on behalf of the rights 
of Christians, at least more than his predecessors who didn't care. Um, is he a believer? He doesn't profess to be. Uh, does God use him to bless believers and to bless Israel? Yes, absolutely. 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 Remember King Cyrus was such a king. King Cyrus was a Gentile king. Whether he came to believe in the Jewish God or not, I cannot be dogmatic, but God certainly blessed him and used him to bless his people for his purposes. It is by him kings reign. He establishes kings and removes kings in the book of Daniel. We ought not think that God cannot use non-believers for his purposes in desperate times. The ship commander in Acts 27 was not a believer, but God used him to bless Paul. Okay. Uh, the Roman governors like Festus in Caesarea, Felipe, uh, Caesarea Maritina, they were not believers, they were pagan Romans. But they protected Paul from the Sanhedrin. It sends 200 Roman legionnaires as a military escort so the Sanhedrin wouldn't kill him or have him killed to escort Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Did God use the unsaved? Yes. He uses the unsaved in desperate times. When his own people are in a backslidden state, they become absolutely treacherous. Remember, backsliders can easily become worse than unsaved people. Backsliders can easily become worse than unsaved people. Remember what Paul said about people who wouldn't support their families and were looking for a free ride from the church. They wanted the dole from the church. They wanted others to support them so they wouldn't have to. Paul says, not that they're unbelievers. He says, they're worse than non-believers. There's unsaved people who have more integrity, more self-respect, and more love for their family than, than, than Christians who wouldn't work. Go to work. I'm looking for a free ride. Um, they're worse than a non-believer. It's a sad and tragic state of affairs when in the season of the ministry of Elijah, past, present, or future, the leadership of God's people or the leadership of the church becomes of a lower standard than the world. Of the lower standard than the world. There are unsaved people who would not exploit the poor and the elderly the way the word faith money preachers do. They would not financially exploit exploit the poor and elderly the way the money pre They're unsaved people who have more integrity than to do that, than the things that are promoted in the Elam movement like Morris Cirillo and so forth. There are people in the world who see right through it, who wouldn't do it, who would not do it. Quite a situation. It's no longer only the Church of Rome. The Southern Baptists in America, among others, have been caught doing it. It happened in Northern Ireland at King Cora, where you had supposedly evangelical clergymen protecting pedophiles in the church. Uh, who did God use to put an end to it? Secular government, unsafe. Now this is tragic. It's tragic when it comes to this. But in an age when God raises up a ministry like Elijah's, that's what happens. People leave Jerusalem for the desert. They go to where the food is. The ravens feed Elijah. Now that's not to say a raven is not a raven. It's not to say a non-believer is a believer. But it is to say God will use who he will to meet the need of those who are truly his. In desperate times, that's what's happening. These are desperate times, it's happening now. At one time in the United States, the idea 
of having a divorced president and remarried would have been unthinkable. It would have been unthinkable that a divorcee who remarried could even get elected. Then you had Reagan who was divorced and remarried. Now you have somebody on his fourth marriage. <laughs> He's still better than the other guys on one marriage. Uh, the way that Christian rights are being suppressed in Britain and America is shocking. Whoever's going to defend them, God's going to use. The ravens feed Elijah. We need to understand that. That doesn't mean they're not a raven, but it does mean God can use them when the spiritual state of his own people or his own children become that desperate. So he goes out there. It shall be you will drink of the brook as I've commanded the ravens to provide for you. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. Notice John the Baptist the same. He went to the east of the Jordan. Bethany beyond the Jordan in the spirit of Elijah. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. He would drink from the brook, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. In these kinds of climates, in this kind of environment, at this kind of period in church history, or in Israel's history, expect things to get worse before they get better. You would wonder how much worse can it get? Teaching little kids in school that same-sex relationships are normal. A law case in America last week where the father of a child fighting the mother of the child in court, a surrogate mother, because she has decided that the seven-year-old little boy is a girl. And she wants to have the baby, the child, seven-year-old, given hormone-suppressing drugs to suppress the production of testosterone, the male hormone. So the child will only be producing estrogen. The female hormone is produced in male kidneys in small quantities. Now, in a normal person, it wouldn't matter. There's not enough estrogen in a normal male because he's producing testosterone. <laughs> but if you suppress the testosterone, the estrogen will begin to have its effect physiologically and psychologically. This a legal right to do this to a seven-year-old who can't decide for himself. And his mother wants to do it, and his father had to go to court to try to stop it. How much worse can it get? How much worse? They have an agenda where they want to say, as we looked at last night, if your church will not perform same-sex marriages, you will lose your tax exemption. Your building will be taxed because of human rights violations. What they want to say is, if you refuse somebody a position as your minister or pastor because of their sexual orientation or gender or whatever, you will lose your status as a tax-exempt property. This, they already have this agenda. This guy, Better O'Rourke, who just dropped out of the American race yesterday, thankfully, he said he wanted to do this. And he's not the only one. They're going to pursue this. We can't send our kids to state schools anymore. We have to homeschool or have Christian schools. They will come in and mandate the curriculum that must be taught in a Christian school. With the Darwinism, with the same sex, 
That will be the next thing. Parents who do not go along with it or who oppose it, social services will want to come after the parents. This is persecution. That's what's going to happen. How much worse can it get? We all tremble for our children and grandchildren, and we should. Remember what Jesus said? Don't weep for me. Things will get worse before they will get better. Why does God allow them to get worse? When you have churches and denominations putting benedictions on same-sex marriage, persecution becomes a necessary evil to separate the true church from the harlot church. And they're doing it. They've got people in the States and now in Britain that they're saying things you wouldn't believe. Just think Steve Chalk in England. Two homosexuals in his church asked him, will you perform a secret same-sex wedding for us? He said, absolutely not. It's going to be public. <laughs> and he says he's born again. Do they ban him? No. <laughs> this is what's happening. God has to allow the persecution. They went after the sons of the prophets. Jezebel will always go after her opponents. It's happening now. You have to understand one aspect of the Jezebel spirit is trying to emasculate and feminize men. You understand? It's trying to emasculate and feminize men. That's what's happening. It's what is happening. Well, let's continue to look. Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath. Zarephath is related to the word for a kind of burning or purification by fire. Misroph in Hebrew be the infinitive which belongs to Sidon, Sidon, in Lebanon. And stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he came and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water and a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord lives, your God, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the dish and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go do as I have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterwards you may make for yourself and for your son one. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the dish of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the hin of the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. When you've got nothing left, when there's nothing left, just a little, and the Lord wants you to take what little you have left and give it up to him and trust him. We've got nothing left. 
One meal, then we're going to starve. No, no, no. Those who invest in the Elijah ministry, it is going to cost them what little they have. Those who invest in what God is doing in such a desperate time, it'll cost them what little they have. Now, once again, he goes to a Gentile land, to Lebanon. Not Aretz Israel. Not anything in the land that God gave through Joshua. It's outside. And he goes to a Gentile woman and her son. Obviously, the Gentile woman is a picture of the Gentile church typologically. It's going to be up against the wall. The situation will become extremely desperate. But there is a promise of God. Trust me. Do what I tell you. Everyone else will go hungry. Others will starve. But no matter what happens, you will have flour in the dish and oil in the jar. Amos, there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, the shemen, the oil, it won't be there. But for those who come into the ministry of Elijah, they're going to have what to eat, and they're going to have the anointing of the Spirit, no matter how desperate things become. But they're going to have to be desperate themselves to get it. Understand? <laughs> They are going to have to be desperate themselves to get it. The Lord is going to bring the faithful church into a period of desperation. It will become desperate. No way out of it except by divine intervention. Lord, please do something. All right, bring me what you got left. But it's all we've got. Bring it. Trust me. Push to the wall. Now this woman, emotionally, is at the end of her rope. Let's see what happens next. Verse 13, uh, 15, so she went and did according to the word of Elijah. Eliyahu Hanavi, my God, he is Yahweh. And she and her household ate for many days. The dish of flour was not exhausted nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Now remember, Elijah was outnumbered by the priests of Baal. In an age like this, for every Elijah or Obadiah or the sons of the prophets, there were 50. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of false prophets. to whom most of the nation listened to. Verse 17, Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so critical, there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come in to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. 
And he called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also bought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray you let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room to the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Things seem to get better. Oil in the jar, grain in the dish. But then the woman who accepts the ministry of Elijah loses what she loves most. Loses what she loves most. Her faith is being tested. She begins to say, Elijah, look what happened since you came. Things seem to get better, but now they only get worse. Right to the wall. This is not an unfamiliar pattern in Scripture. We see it in such passages as Numbers 11. The sons of Israel were liberated from Pharaoh and Miriam grabbed the tambourine and the horse and rider thrown into the sea. But then when they got hungry and tired and thirsty, they began to complain about Moses. What did you bring us out here for to die? <laughs> complain against Elijah. We listened to you, we trusted you, we believed you. Look at the mess we're in now as a result of it. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want to be a leader at a time like this. You do not want to be a leader among the children of God or the people of God at a time like this. People who trusted you, who believed you, are going to pay a price for it. And they're going to doubt you. And they're going to doubt God himself. when you have nothing left and God says put it on the altar <laughs> first she had little left and God said put it on the altar as it were now it's her son now the game is over everything is lost the thing she loved and cherished the most probably more than her own life is taken from her. This is desperate. Desperate. Why does God allow his people or people who believe to do this? Well, let's understand something. When God gave his own son in our place, he gave the thing, the one he loved the most over to death, only to raise him up again. This foreshadows the death and resurrection of Christ. You understand it? God wants his people to experience what he experienced. He wants them to know the depths of his own love and the pain of his own loss. The faithful church will understand the depths of God's love, but they will also understand the pain of his loss. One of my favorite historical figures in the history of the body of Christ in Great Britain is the author John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. 
literary masterpiece, even secular people praise it for its literary content. The book is incredible. You look at John Bunyan. What kind of a man could write such an amazing book? I always tell people, after the scripture, after the Bible, that's the best book I've ever read. I've never read anything as good or as edifying or as encouraging or as realistic, as theologically accurate as the Pilgrim's Progress, except for the scripture itself. What kind of a guy would God use to look at his life? <laughs> The tragedy that befell his family. Then they locked him up 14 years. Unbelievable, what a rotten life. He loved not his life in this world. It's always the people who love not their life in this world who God can use the most. Always. It'll always be the people who love not their life in this world who God will use the most. But in a desperate season like the one Elijah faced and like the one the church is going to face in the last days and like the one Israel is ultimately going to face at the very close of the age, everything's going to go to the wall the Lord's going to allow it to be taken. But he's going to give it back. We have to trust him. Everything he takes from us, he will give back in abundance. Think of Job. Lost it all! Not only did he get it all back, he got it all back and more. Look at Job. Look at the widow. Look at John Bunyan. But above all, look at God. We are in a desperate time. I wish I could tell you things are going to get better before they get worse. <laughs> no, things are going to get worse before they get better. And even when they do get better, fasten your seatbelt. Remember, it's like birth pangs, we're told in John 16. In maternity, when the birth contractions begin, they can ease up for interim periods. They can stop for interim periods. But that's a false respite. They come back with a double intensity until ultimately the baby's born. That's what Revelation 12 teaches us. That's the way it's going to be. Just because the contractions recede and the graph stops moving, don't think it's over. <laughs> it's just regearing for the next bout. Having a baby. Things get worse before they get better, don't they? Birth banks. The reality is things are going to get worse before they get better. Although we may expect interim periods of blessing and respite, until Jesus comes, don't expect anything good to really happen. It's gone too far. With the abortion, the homosexuality, the apostasy in the church, it's gone too far. It has just gone too far. Remember, 2 Chronicles 7.14 was never for the church. It was for Israel, first of all. Now, the principle, if my people who are called by my name and all that. Well, that is true. 
but they reached a point in the days of Amos and Hosea in Israel, in the northern kingdom, and they reached a point in the days of Jeremiah and Judah in the southern kingdom, when 2 Chronicles 7.14 no longer applied. It applied at the time the prophecy was given. But once things degenerated with the idolatry and the killing the babies, the sacrifice to Molech, it had gone too far. A revival could not save the nation. Even though revival came in the days of Josiah, the nation could not be saved. It could only delay the inevitable. If revival comes to Britain, if revival comes to America, if revival comes to any of these Western Protestant countries, if it does, and that's a big if, if it does, it can only delay the inevitable the way it did in the days of Josiah's revival. The sin had become so terrible under Manasseh with killing the babies, judgment had to fall. The judgment of God must come. The modern nation Israel has killed more Jewish children than Adolf Hitler with non-therapeutic abortion, the modern state of Israel has killed more Jewish children than Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. The United States has murdered 55 million, less than one-tenth of one percent for any clinical reason, for any medical medically valid cause. 99 and 9 tenths percent of 55 million? <laughs> That's pretty bad, isn't it? It's bad. Now, interim periods of respite, yeah. Right now in the United States, there's more women opposed to, to abortion particularly late-term abortion, then are in favor of it. But the pro-death proponents hypocritically yell, women's rights, women's rights, as if they're the spokesman for women, but most women don't agree with them. The way they lie is unbelievable. The majority of women do not identify as feminists, but the feminists make themselves the spokesman for other women. They're the most sexist people in the world. They're the most oppressive and domineering of women in the world. They set themselves up as the spokesman for other women when most women don't agree with them. This is terrible. That's the way Jezebel was. She imposed her own corrupt will on the nation. She imposed her own corrupt will on the nation. And she did it by means of both religion and politics. And with Naboth's vineyard, it became economic. This is what happens in the book of Revelation. The Antichrist will impose the will of Satan by means that are religious, then political, then economic. And it is in that kind of environment that the ministry of Elijah rises up. Why is she so obsessed with him? As we looked at last night, why is she so obsessed with Elijah and a handful of people around him, driven by him? <laughs> She's obsessed. She's always been obsessed. And she always will be to any opposition that comes in the name of the Lord. This poor widow now loses her son. But she gets him back. Anything God takes from us, he will give back. Even our own biological lives, 
even if we face martyrdom, as many Christians in the world do face it. Anything that we lose for the sake of Christ will be given back in abundance, plus, plus. Condition, you've got to trust him. You've got to believe him at his word. What does the woman say? Now I know that the word of God is in your mouth. Now I know you speak the word of God in truth. She had doubts, doesn't she? We all have doubts at times, don't we? We all have doubts at times. God proves us wrong. Maybe we feel guilty about the doubts in retrospect. But like that widow, we all experience doubt in such difficult times. That's in the scripture for a reason. That is what happens. That is what will happen to us. Expect to be attacked with doubt. Not only by the devil, but just from within our own selves. Just from within our own selves. The devil may use that, but even from within our own selves, we will be attacked with doubt. Another reason God allows such dire things to transpire <laughs> is to prove himself we can trust him. <laughs> now notice there's a slight hint, a slight hint, howbeit to a lesser degree, that Elijah doubted. Oh, Lord, don't let this happen to her. Remember John the Baptist? He sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Even Elijah and John, having the spirit of Elijah, began to have doubts, questions. Not to the same extent or degree others did, but nobody will be immune from these attacks on our faith. You understand? Both individually and corporately. Our faith will be attacked. My faith has been attacked. Your faith has been attacked. Our faith has been attacked. In the end, God always proves himself. Remember what Jesus said? Oh, you foolish of heart to believe. <laughs> Chapter 18, verse 1. Now what happened after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. After many days, in times of testing and trial, we always want a word from the Lord immediately. <laughs> One of the things that makes times of such testing and trial times of testing and trial is that it appears that God has gone silent. We are seeking him, but he does not appear to be responding. But we have to bear in mind two things. One, he's already told us ahead of time what we needed to know to go through that. Hold fast to what he already said. Secondly, he proved himself in the past. We can trust him to do it again. There will be prolonged 
times when God seems to be silent. However, as with Moses, even when the Shekinah did not move in power, even when Moses did not have prophecies, the manna fell every day. So too, even in those times when God appears to have fallen silent, there will still be grain, flour in the dish. This will be there. This will be there. It will sustain us. He will speak when the time is right to speak. Notice it's the third year of a three and a half year time period that God has fixed. As we looked at last night, Elijah prayed that it would not rain for three and a half years. Now this tells us certain things. One, although he was experiencing the consequences of the drought and the people around him were experiencing the consequences of the drought, God was providing for them in it. He prayed for the drought. He prayed for the drought in the hope that in their desperation the nation would repent. I remember when I and others like me, I was not the only one, but I was one of the more visible ones, but not the only one. What was being said about myself and people like Philip Powell, people like Charlie Douglas, there were others. During the counterfeit revivals, and they were saying this was, they were just like the priests of Baal. They were going bananas trying to make something happen. <laughs> yeah, trying to make something happen. I knew God's judgment. And others did, Philip Powell did, others did. God's judgment was going to come on British Pentecostalism. That it was going to fizzle, that it was going to decline, that they'd have no rain, that everything they're into was going to come to a big nothing other than decline, they have no future. How rapid the decline will be? Well, slowly starving to death is a cruel death, isn't it? Slowly starving to death is a cruel death. But as it got close to the end of the three and a half year period, which corresponds to the two times, time and a half time in Daniel, and 1,260 days in Revelation 12, etc., God begins to speak. He doesn't speak until he's getting ready to do something. Just wait. But when he gets closer, he speaks before he does it. The Lord does not do things without warning his people what's coming. We're told he does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. He does nothing. There will always be those who know. There will always be those who God tips off with his spirit. There will always be those who can see ahead. There will always be those. There won't be many of them, but they will be the only ones who count. If you've got 500 or 5,000 people in a pitch dark cave, absolutely zero light, zero background light, but a dozen of the 5,000 have night vision glasses. <laughs> and they can draw on what little light there is and amplify it. That's how those things work. 
They're the only 12 that matter. <laughs> it's only the ones who can see in the dark that matter. It doesn't matter that there's only a dozen of them and 5,000 who can't see anything. It's only that dozen that matters. It was only the 7,000 who mattered. It was only Elijah and Obadiah and the sons of the prophets who mattered. The only ones who matter are the ones who will be able to see. We have a situation now where in the days of Elijah, days like that, we are not only up against blindness, we are up against willful blindness. Willful blindness. John 9 type stuff. I came that those who see will become blind and those who are blind will see. They're willfully blind. Willfully. The priests of Baal were not blind. They were willfully blind. Willfully. Sanhedrin were willfully blind. Willfully blind. Being blind is bad enough. Being willfully blind. Persistence in gross sin is something that will induce blindness. A spirit of error, God gives them over to it. Romans 1 with the homosexuals and lesbians would be a case in point. They're willfully blind. What's happened to Israel, unbelieving Israel and the Jews? A veil put over their face when they read the Torah. Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. You, don't be you choose not to believe the Torah. Because you don't believe Moses, you don't believe me. You've chosen your blindness. That's a horrible thing, isn't it? Think of what happened in Sodom the homosexual gangs, God struck them blind. He struck them blind. Why? When you read the rescue of Lot in Genesis with those maddened homosexual gangs, remember, twice the New Testament says that stuff's going to happen again. Twice the New Testament says it's going to be like the days of Lot. The way God rescued Lot is the way God is going to rescue the faithful church. And militant homosexuality is going to increase and oppress and threaten the people of God. But when they were struck blind, when they tried to rape the angels who appeared as men, even in their blindness, they were trying to find the door and trying to force their way. That was unimaginable. That somebody can be so given over and consumed by an unnatural passion. By a lust that is not even based on a natural drive, but an unnatural one. That they were still trying to satiate their perverted passions. It didn't matter to them that they were blind. You understand? They were so controlled by that sin. This is the kind of environment we're coming to. It's the kind of environment we're coming to. Just look at it. The HIV infection rate among homosexuals in the developed world is astronomically higher in its averages than among heterosexuals. I mean, junkies get it, and people who come in contact with blood can get it, but, you know, it, it's basically <laughs> your odds of becoming HIV infected as a homosexual <laughs> are statistically humongous compared to heterosexuals. Doesn't matter. They're blind. Why are they blind? They choose to be.
you've got a 40% suicide rate. 40%. Four out of 10. Two out of five people who undergo transgender surgery will take their own life. Out of every five who do it, two will kill themselves. What's the average suicide rate? 2%, 3%? 40%. Can't you see this? No. They're not blind. They are willfully blind. LBGTG, transgender, whatever it is, they're up to about 26 letters now. Unbelievable. Can't you see this? 40% are going to kill themselves. Can't you see this is not right? You're a homophobe. I'm a homophobe? No, you're nuts. <laughs> Just blind, what we want? Elijah's day, they just didn't want to know. The truth did not matter to them. The facts were irrelevant. Facts become irrelevant. Factual reality is dismissed. Go and show yourself to Ahab. I'll send rain on the face of the earth. Now understand, most of what the scriptures say, former rain, latter rain type stuff, a pouring out of the Holy Spirit at the end of the age. When you read Job in context, when you read Peter's charisma and Acts chapter 2 commenting on Job in context, and when you read Zechariah 12, the primary meaning of the outpouring in the last days is not on the church. It is on Israel after the church is taken. Concerning the church, there is far more, far more emphasis on a great end time falling away than a great and time revival. Far more! In the next book we have coming out, No Bomb and Gilead, we look at this. Once the faithful church is removed, once the resurrection happens, the rapture takes place, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of the things God does is focused on Israel. The church is gone. Some of the nonsense people have invented. The rapture is going to cause a great revival. No, it's not. We're told directly. And men still did not repent of their evil deeds when these terrible things happen. This idea of an outpouring, it is largely concerned with Israel and the Jews, not in any primary sense with the church. In fact, the outpouring takes place after the church is gone. Again, this will be addressed in the forthcoming book, No Bomb in Gilead. The nonsense that people have invented with the Latter-day Reign teaching has been crazy. From it came the Manifest Sun stuff, the ideas of, 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 of that, that once Pentecostals rejected things like William Branham 
and E.W. Kenyon, they rejected those people as crazy. And, and as heretical, but also just as crazy. There were Pentecostal, the average Pentecostal preacher would have thought that William Branham was crazy. And he would have been right. Certainly demonically deluded. Those very things that they once dismissed as being crazy have become almost mainstream, <laughs> doctrinally within their thinking. The stuff that they used to dismiss as nuts. I remember when the crazy manifestations took place. Those same people saying it was the Holy Clifford Hill pointed this out. He said five years ago, these same people were saying that those who do these things need deliverance. Five years earlier, these same people would have said they needed deliverance. Now they're saying it's the Holy Spirit. I remember Clifford Hill said that. He was 110% correct. He could, he could not possibly have been more correct. It's unbelievable. Oh, the Spirit's going to be outpoured. But it's not going to be in the way people think. Israel is God's timepiece for the nations. The Gentile woman in this story, in this narrative, represents the Gentile church. Do you understand? If Elijah is one of those two witnesses in Revelation 11, where is he prophesying? In Jerusalem, in Israel, not in the Gentile nations. So it happens, Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now at that time, Samaria was not the Samaritans of John 4 or of the book of Nehemiah. That happened after the Assyrian captivity. Here, Samaria simply means the heartland of the 10 northern tribes of Israel, as opposed to Judah. The heartland of the 10 northern tribes. The capital was a place called Sebast. Sebast. Sebast is one of the very few major biblical sites in Israel I have personally never been to. Uh, difficult to get to, not much to see there, but it exists. Um, and know where it is. <clears throat> um, Samaria at this time were not the Samaritans. It was just the geographical heartland of the 10 northern tribes. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. The famine was critical in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah. This is not the prophet Obadiah who wrote the book Obadiah. This is a different Obadiah. Ob Obadiah the servant of Yahweh. The name means the servant of Yahweh. Okay. Who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. This was the guy who risked his own life. He saw what was happening from the inside. He knew about the relationship between Ahab and Jezebel. He knew about her control and influence over him and how she controlled the government through him, or at least greatly influenced it for evil. He knew the politics, he knew the agenda. This is where it takes place. We're going to break now, and we'll continue with chapter 18 and our second half after coffee. <laughs>